Welcome to the Scrum.org Community Podcast, a podcast from the home of Scrum. In this podcast, we feature professional Scrum trainers and other Scrum practitioners sharing their stories and experiences to help learn from the experience of others. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Ripley with Agile for Humans and professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org. I'm stepping in as a guest host for episodes highlighting the experiences of other Scrum.org professional scrum trainers. I hope you enjoy getting to know these amazing people. All right, welcome. New episode of Becoming a Scrum Master. Uh, I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. This this one's fun. Um, of course, we've got Ralph Yoakum here, fellow PST, product management extraordinaire, um, one of the authors of one of the versions of the product owner course at scrum.org. So, Ralph, huge uh, background and experience in all these things. How long have you been a PST? Uh, I like to consider myself a dinosaur in that regard. Yeah. I became a PST only 2010. So, I'm, to my best on the recollection, I'm the first one actually in Europe. And uh, back in the days, I, I was actually handpicked by Ken Schreiber himself, which was a very enlightening but also a very um, strenuous process. Very good. So, Ralph, you've been around a while, and uh, you know, I think we were both blessed that we were coming up through the the ranks when Ken was still teaching. Um, that was quite an experience. So, yes. I think I um, maybe I'll tell you some stories about that some other time. But for this, we want to hear about those enlightening moments. So, right off the bat, here, can you share the story of how you first encountered Scrum and what motivated you to become a Scrum Master? Was there a particular moment or experience that sparked your interest? Well, um, well my, my background is IT, so I studied computer science and uh, did basically started my professional career as a programmer, which wasn't working so good, uh, classical problems we had. Um, then I discovered extreme programming early 2000, and this really turned the world as I knew it totally around. And I looked into that and I just said, yeah, that makes sense. So late 2000, I actually, uh, in my team, we started doing pair programming. We had a continuous integration system set up. It was called Cruise Control. Um, and that worked really well on a team level. But then I didn't really see how does this fit into the organization. Um, that's when I kept looking around. And then in 2001, I discovered the book uh, from Ken Beck where he describes Scrum. I just said, nice, you know, this is the connection to the organization. And uh, that's basically, this was 2001. So now that's like over 20 years ago. And that's basically since, so I was still a programmer in the beginning and then I became more the scrum master of the team, but still being a programmer. And essentially that's how my, my journey started in, in the track of, of scrum mastery. I did my first CSM training in uh, 2005. And that's okay. when I really realized Yep, that, that's what I want to be. However, uh, then later on, I re realized product owner is also very important. <laughs> yep. Interesting. So what, is there a specific project or situation kind of in, in your past where there was that eureka or light bulb moment where you realized that there's some real power and potential behind Scrum? And if so, could you describe that moment? I mean, I always started working, always knew that's the right thing. But for me, the, the really big moment, I just said, yeah, that's it. It was a project where I was with a team in, in California. And we had another team, two teams, actually. We were three teams all together in India, Pune. And there was this one discovery suddenly when our product owner, she came into the room, she was pale and she said, hey guys, I gotta tell you something and you will kill me afterwards. She says, no, no, don't worry, just explain it and we'll be fine. And then she told us that there's, it was about a, um, a pharmaceutical application that something changes with the, the plate layout and something like that. So essentially what she told us means that everything we have set up from an architectural point of view, from data storage and management goes by by. And uh, so we Fun just day. said, okay, are we really going to kill you here? Yeah. And um, so at this moment, we stopped our sprint. 
we assessed the situation, what we thought it would be taking. So we, we came up with probably four or five weeks. Uh, then we set up a late session for us late for them early with the India team and just say, hey guys, stop everything you're doing, drop your pencil, look into what the changes would be for you in that regard. And they came back the next day, about three, four weeks, similar, a little bit less. And then we basically started a new sprint. We canceled the current sprint. We started a new sprint. And um, we were keeping on working on our side uh, in Foster City with what we was decoupled. And the two teams in India, they were looking into re-architecture and everything. And then after five, six days, they called us or sent us an email. Hey, we're done. Ready? So, Essentially, you know, because we had everything set up in a good infrastructure way, uh, you know, having those vertical slices of work product, which is a really powerful enabling constraint. And then just said, you know, we made a change which was required. We run all the tests, we saw what was broken, and then we fixed it, and then we did the next change, and did the next change, and then everything, and we crunched to that. And after about you know, six days, they were done. Well, we needed to adjust the UI a little bit afterwards, but overall, that was everything which was needed. Very nice. So we're going to shift gears. That's some great experience you're sharing there, Ralph. Just curious about your perception uh, and execution and your thoughts on the Scrum Master role. Just curious if they've evolved since the first time you, you started fulfilling that role, right? So has your perception and execution of the Scrum Master role, or as we like to say, the accountability, has that evolved? And are there any aspects of the role or accountability that you view differently now compared to when you first started? Actually, I think I've got a circle. Now, when I was first time Scrum Master, you know, uh, I mean, I was really colleagual and everything, like good, trying to be a good person, but I was also demanding and I told people you know, when they were wrong. And um, I think this came up around, life is a pendulum for me in some degree. You know, it always swings from one side to the other. And, it's always a movement. And then about 2010, I think, suddenly I was picking up, oh, well, you're a certain leader. You you never can tell people they're wrong. You have to coach them and everything. And, and I, I think these are good practices, but it's it's too single-sided again. And then I just, um, shifted more in this direction. But eventually I came around just saying, you know, sometimes you have to tell people how things are. And, and the way I think about it, it's, it's a, I can't remember from where I read it, but it says, loving but uncompromising i love my team i love the people i work with but i'm uncompromising and if sometimes it means saying no or you have to do it that way then so be it yeah i think we often forget consulting is another stance of a scrum master <laughs> well, it can be right yeah yeah so what advice would you give to someone aspiring to become a scrum master is there a particular mindset, skill, or habit that you believe is crucial for success in this role? I think being a scrum master is actually, if you think about it, why would you want to be one? I mean, in the end of the day, you know, you, you're hurting cats, you work with people, and, and if things go well, it's them. They're successful. No? Yeah. You give them all the glory. And if things go wrong, well, it's you uh, who is going to be playing. So essentially, you know, you you can never really win. Uh, you can pretty much just get get blamed. Now, on the other hand, if you enjoy that, if you enjoy seeing making people succeed, like like as a coach of, of a sports team, you know, if you enjoy them, you know, they become better. They know how to pass, to collaborate, work together win games, maybe win this season. If this is what you like, uh, also considering that if they start to lose, you might be thrown out. <laughs> By all means, I think you will be a really good scrum master. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the hardest things to, to come to terms with is that not a lot of it is about you. And um, just like a sports coach, you might be tossed out after a while. Yeah. Last question here, Ralph. Uh, what is the one book every Scrum Master should read? And of course, we'll link your book on product ownership that's in the Scrum.org series in the notes. So I'll, I'll say that one for you, right? So great book on product ownership uh, that he wrote with uh, Don McGrill. But um, aside from that, which of course, we it's great. 
What's the book that you think every scrum master should read? You know, I, I couldn't tell you one book here right now. I mean, there's, there's the great book of Simon Reindel and Stephanie Ockerman when they talk about Scrum Mastery. Um, I think if you're really serious about becoming a Scrum Master, it would be the original book of Ken Schwaber, which is probably somewhat outdated. This goes back 2001. Love that. Um, so you're talking about the, the Schwaber Beatles book. book. And then, then you know, look into different areas as well. I love that. I think it's a great recommendation. So it's the the stoplight book that he wrote with uh, Mike Beetle, right? Exactly. Where you have the, the colors written in their own color, <laughs> which I, is kind of really like twisting your brain. And I think that that's really the cover for the book as well. I think working through Ken's books, I so some of the scrum wording has changed, but the stories are great. You know, it's all held up really well. No, I think that's a wonderful recommendation, Ralph. Yeah. Well, Ralph, I appreciate you doing this. That's five questions. Just want to give you an opportunity to promote anything to the audience. Let them know how to get a hold of you. Of course, we'll add any notes or links in the comments or in the description. But how can people get a hold of you, Ralph? Well, you can find me in the usual social media channels, LinkedIn, uh, X, and so on. So just type in my name. You will find me there. Cool. Looking forward to hearing from you and uh, have a chat. Awesome.